Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second panel of this conference on the global governance of plastic pollution, transforming the global plastic economy. So this panel focuses on the topic of trends and forecasts of the global plastic economy, and we'll be sketching out the scale and magnitude of some of the challenges facing us in light of the previous discussion that we've heard about the perspectives and the priorities for this global treaty on plastic pollution. So as you heard from our previous panel, or no doubt know already, the timing of this meeting is particularly important. We're meeting in the margins of this week's ministerial conference on marine litter and plastic pollution. And we're also in the run up to the second part of the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, which is a biennial meeting of the United Nations governing body on the environment. Also, on the 3rd to the 7th of October next month, we have the first ministerial conference of the multilateral trade system. This is the UNCTAD's quadrennial conference. And at this conference, member states will negotiate an agreed view on the state of the world economy, where the critical pressure points lie, and what are the priorities relating to trade and investment and development. So there's something of a surprise in the process thus far, is that the challenge of plastic pollution and the related trade and development responses have not been raised by mental reforms under discussion. I think the discussion we had at our first session already hinted at some of these impacts. And so I think it's very important timing that we have these discussions. We also have on the calendar, the UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties in Glasgow in October and November and the 12th WTO ministerial in December. So I'm not talking about this lineup of political offense, events just to have a big list of important events. No, the point is to show that we have a unique opportunity to, to mainstream the efforts to get an effective and coherent response to the plastic pollution challenge. On top of this, all of these things are taking place within the ongoing threat of coronavirus which is impacting heavily on global health and economic stability. And it has big implications for global coordination and for overseas development assistance, for example, and for the low plastic economy, the car low carbon economy and the circular economy. So as I say, we are in the middle of a number of events and circumstances that are highly fluid and they're all ongoing processes in which the voices of industry stakeholders and civil society and United Nations member governments and others can contribute and they can shape. So it's a very, very important time. Um, I just will quickly also express our gratitude to the Swiss Network for International Studies, who've given their financial support to this project, which Caroline and I put together two years ago and including this conference today. And today, UNCTAD and the Global Governance Center along with researchers from Swiss-based universities and international organizations and stakeholder groups, many of whom's name you will have seen as co-sponsoring of this event. Everyone is advancing research and policy analysis and compiling data that's playing a very important role in framing these discussions. The first meetings we held with this, with um, the Graduate Institute in UNCTAD were two years ago in Geneva, in person. It, now almost unbelievable that we were able to do that. Um, we could not have achieved this without the support of the SNIS, so thank you. Um, I'll also take a very brief moment to say thank you to my colleague and friend Carolyn, without which uh, this would not have happened, because as I'm sure you've all seen, she is a force of nature and has done some wonderful things. So let's get started with our session. We have truly stellar speakers on the panel today, and I'm really looking forward to their contribution. So I move ahead. All speakers have been given seven minutes. And when we get to six minutes, if you hear a little noise, that's me ringing my little Swiss bell here to try and keep us all on time. We will collect questions at the end. So please put your questions in the Q&A function or the chat if all that, that is what works for you. And uh, we'll try and round them all up at the end of the session. And we finish at 3.30. So there's a 15 minute break before the next one. So it's my pleasure to start the session by inviting Peter Borki to speak to us. He's the Principal Administrator of the Environmental Directorate in the OECD. And he will share with us some, uh, some early uh, taste 
of the OECD Plastic Outlook Report. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. And I'm trying to find my presentation, which for some reason I now can't see. Just move it here and see if that changes something. All right, there it is. All right, I hope you can now all see this. Um, so, uh, you know, thank, first of all, thank you very much uh, for, for an invitation and, and thank you, Diana, for the uh, uh, nice introduction. I'm actually the circuit economy lead in the environment directorate at the OECD. Um, I will try to be brief and fit within the seven minutes um, while covering quite, quite a bit of ground I've been asked to contribute to the scene setting uh, for the session. Um, and let me start by saying that, of course, plastics uh, have become one of the top environmental priorities uh, for, for governments and environmental authorities around the world. This is also, uh, of course, the case of OECD member countries. And they have asked us uh, to develop a global plastics outlook to support their ongoing efforts to curb plastics pollution. And so this is what I will be mostly talking about. Um, uh, the global plastics outlook will uh, both analyze recent trends uh, and it will project uh, these trends also uh, into the future to 2060. Um, including some scenario analysis uh, of policy interventions. For this, uh, we have assembled new data um, in the what we call the Global Plastics Outlook database um, and mobilized our environment economy modeling tools uh, to develop the projections. Um, and we hope that this uh, is really a contribution to research that will be seen to be novel and truly additional. Um, Peter, could we ask you to put it in presentation mode on uh, your PowerPoint so we can all see the full oh, okay. slides? I Thank you, because they're beautiful. Thank you so much. I thought I had done that, but thanks for uh, uh, mentioning that to me. It's great. I hope this, this is now full, full screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so given the work on our Global Plastics Outlook is still underway, um, what I can share here, unfortunately, are not the numbers, because these are still under development, uh, but I can share some of the elements uh, of, you know, the Global Plastics Outlook narrative, and so that, that's what I will try to do here very briefly, of course. Um, first of all, uh, let me focus uh, on some trends. Uh, so this is data uh, on the production of uh, uh, plastics, global uh, production of plastics that come from Geyer. Um, and we're working very closely with Geyer and his colleagues uh, in, in our projections as well. Uh, and as you can see, and we all know this, plastics have moved from barely nothing in the 50s to uh, more than 400 megatons now uh, uh, around this time. Um, this, and this uh, you can see here uh, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a different graph, then translates, uh, of course, into a number of environmental effects. And the first and foremost effect, of course, is the generation of, of plastic waste that needs to be managed. Here you can see Geyer's um, numbers on, on production of, of generation of plastic waste, which show that more than 300 megatons are becoming waste every year. Um, and these are then projected uh, by Geyer uh, to essentially triple to 2050. There are other projections as well out there by Le Breton and colleagues that look at a smaller share of plastics, only the municipal plastic wastes, uh, which are at a lower level at this uh, point and then projected also to increase, essentially to double by, by, by 2060. All project projections will be closer to Geyer's uh, numbers. Uh, and of course, the uh, um, plastic waste generation then generates uh, emissions uh, of plastic pollution, uh, both macro and microplastics that enter the environment. We've already heard in the previous session about some of the environmental impacts that these 
generate, let me maybe just add one, which is uh, slightly more surprising maybe. Um, not only uh, do plastics enter oceans uh, and water uh, ways and, and courses, but they do also uh, enter the atmosphere. They're also being transmitted by air and they contribute to air pollution. And what you can see on this slide is the deposition of particulate matter uh, from tires and brakes in 2019. Uh, that result and, and this shows total suspended PM and micrograms per square meter. And you can see the major sources here are North America, Europe, um, and, and East Asia. Um, and of course, um, uh, plastics uh, production uh, also leads to major emissions of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've also heard that in the previous session, we estimate these at around 4% of total greenhouse gas emissions globally. So these impacts are all uh, expected to increase very significantly uh, along the way. And I've already heard the bell, so that, that means I only have one minute left. All right, well, let me just then say very briefly um, that what we do in the report uh, is uh, that we also look uh, at, at some encouraging trends. Uh, hopefully, this is a sign that, you know, we're, we're in a position to reverse these uh, uh, worrying trends. Uh, first of all, uh, we will be showing that innovation uh, in green plastics has significantly increased and continues to increase uh, over recent years. Um, we will show that uh, there have been major advances in, in, in better managing uh, trade and plastic waste as through uh, the Basel Convention. Um, here the challenge of course is uh, that you want to uh, better control leakage uh, while still ensuring economic efficiency through global trade. Um, we are also uh, going to show that there are some encouraging signs in markets for recycled plastics, some segments of which really show uh, you know, some, some strengthening, um, mainly thanks to uh, recycled content routes, which, which are being put out. Uh, we'll also provide an overview of policies, both at the international and national level, and, and show some, some encouraging trends there as well, such as the G20 targets that have been set uh, in the form of the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision, uh, and increasing official development assistance that now goes to places, mostly places in Asia, for better management of plastics. Um, and uh, uh, finally, we'll also look uh, at uh, the impact that the COVID crisis has on all of, of this, even though there the ev evidence turns out to be more mixed. So I'll just end there and, and maybe just underline that uh, uh, I think at the OECD we completely agree that uh, a global uh, approach is needed uh, to effectively deal with these challenges. Uh, plastic pollution is clearly transboundary. Uh, it affects global commons um, and is a shared responsibility for all countries on the globe. And we hope that with the Global Plastics Outlook, we'll be able to chart a pathway um, through the policy scenarios that we'll be developing that will allow to achieve the Osaka Blue Ocean vision as laid out in the G20. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That's really interesting, and we look forward to to seeing that uh, that report. It seems like it's going to have a lot of important meat in it for us to to uh, to to read. Um, thank you. I'd like to turn now to Nakal Saran. Are you there, Nakal? Oh, super. So yeah. Nakal is the chief operating officer of the Mindaroo Foundation. I have to say, Nakal, I've greatly uh, appreciated some of your publications. They're really been extremely useful and insightful. Uh, so we look forward to your presentation now. The Plastic Waste Makers Index, who produces and funds single-use plastic. Over to you. I'll ring my okay. bell after six minutes and then you have one more minute. Perfect. Well, Diana, first of all, thank you for the feedback. Always encouraging to hear that people are actually reading the report. Um, so, you know, first of all, uh, thanks everybody for, for being here and for this opportunity. Um, to give us a chance to tell you a little bit about our report, which we launched in May of this year. 
Um, I thought Hi, I'd just start. Could you please put in presenter mode? Thank you. Yeah, I'm just about to, sorry, give me one second. Um, so just wanted to, sit, first of all, to sort of thank everybody for, um, is that working? Uh, no, actually this is your speaker view. Um, uh, okay, let's uh, switch that one second. Sorry, Diana, I hope you're not counting this against my time. Does that work? Perfect, thank you. Excellent. All right, so, um, you know, just a bit of background for us around the Mindaroo Foundation. Um, we, the foundation is actually in its 20th year, started by Andrew and Nicola Forrest. Um, it is now one of the largest uh, philanthropic organizations in the in Asia Pacific region. And I'm actually chief operating officer of the No Plastic Waste Initiative, which is one of the largest, largest initiatives of, of the foundation with the focus of sort of eliminating plastic leakage into nature and accelerating a circular economy for plastics by 2030. Um, when we sort of kicked off our work, what we realized very quickly was that there, we couldn't find a robust baseline around the current state of affairs on plastics, particularly single use plastics, which is the ones that we tend to find in the environment and where we couldn't find the accountability that moved all the way up through the value chain at a company by company level. There's a lot of incredible work that's been done out there on, at a national level, but we wanted to see is there a way for us to actually work backwards to understand who are the actual producers who are accountable for this and could we connect those dots. There's obviously a lot of work that's been done at the brand level. We've seen those reports and all the articles, but much less has been done around the production and the conversion side of this. So that's where we chose to focus on our work. Um, we focus on 5%, five of the largest polymers, so PET, HDPE, PP, LDPE, LLDPE. Um, and the goal was to say, you know, and what we saw was that, you know, 98% of the production from, of these polymers really came from fossil fuel based sources and only 2% came from recycled feedstock. And what we saw was we we're trying to do is sort of say that there is accountability that actually sits across the entire value chain. And while there's a lot of focus on brands, there's just as much need to focus on, on producers, particularly as we found that that's also where you see the highest concentration in the, in the value chain. So what, what have we tried to do here? So one is sort of follow the material. So there's a material flow analysis of who's producing polymers that end up being single use plastics and what markets do they end up in and how much of it actually turns into waste. The second is actually to follow the money, who's funding the production, and in a sense, effectively enabling the waste, cr the waste crisis, whether they realize it or not. Um, and this is done both in terms of financing the projects, but also in terms of the financial ownership and the ultimate ownership of these, um, of these assets. And then what we also tried to do is say, look, there, there is a positive story that we want to be able to tell as well, how much are we seeing in terms of a commitment towards circularity and how quickly are we likely to see this um, landscape change. It's important to say that this work couldn't have been done without an incredible set of partners. Um, this includes sort of the London Grantham Institute, the Indian Institute of Technology, the Stockholm Environment Institute, Wood McKinsey, Planet Tracker, um, Neural Alpha and Profunda. And we also had the support of KPMG who actually audited and provided assurance on the report. We, while we didn't pursue a peer review process, we felt like if um, limited assurance from a, a audit firm is good enough for businesses, that's the approach that we were going to take for ourselves. Won't go into this in a lot of detail, but these just to give you a sense of the level of detail that we went into behind each of the steps, what the key sources of data were, but really it started with this fact that we could track at an asset level, so 1,200 production facilities around the world. What are they producing? Who's financed that production? Where is it going? And can we actually trace this all the way down um, to an ultimate point of waste generation? And what we found is that we could with level, different levels of confidence, obviously, as we move from left to right. But um, the attempt here was to sort of get the first assessment out. The other piece is you know, looking at where are we getting the ownership and financing data from to looking at Bloomberg data and Orbis data to really understand how these shareholders um, uh, in, are invested in these companies and can we actually take production and waste generation and allocate it across um, their different shareholding. So that's how we've done that analysis. And then also in terms of loan and underwriting, being able to actually look at every single project that's there, who's actually uh, gone through to, to, to finance. And we've been able to do this sort of from a historical basis. 
So what did we find? It's conscious of time, and I'm going through this, but I'll drop the link in for the report, and you can see all the um, the results and the gory details. But you know, just 20%, 20 uh, polymer producers account for 50% of all single-use um, plastic waste generated globally. So um, as you as we think about accountability and points of intervention, as we think about a global treaty, there's a really strong um, and a compelling reason for why you would want to focus on the polymer side, because the choices that the polymer producers make in terms of the kind of feedstock they use, whether it's fossil fuel based or recycled feedstock, can and will drive much of the change that we expect to see downstream in the system. By choosing to commit to recycled content, they are helping to drive and create um, you know, a commoditization of plastic waste at the other end, which will then allow us to think about the scaling of collection and sortation desperately needed. The second is that you see a lot of household name uh, investors and banks that are enabling um, the single use production, this is similar to what you see in the climate space. It's a similar cast of characters. Um, and the question is, you know, how do we both as individuals, but as governments actually sort of think about um, creating some influence there? Not necessarily about divestment, as you would see in a climate um, story, but, you know, how do you use shareholder accountability and responsibility to actually get polymer pursued producers to actually commit to using more recycled materials. Um, I think there's only one company in the top 20 that has a, a, a relative commitment around using recycled materials. So the third is that we see a collective industry failure. This is not about responsibility just at one level, but there's an incredible amount of coordination that's needed across the value chain in order to be able to make this transition work. There's a chicken and egg problem here. If we can't get a commitment to use recycled waste, how do we then justify the financing and collection of plastic waste material in the first place? So we have to find ways to make this coordination work more effectively. And that's another pillar of our work as an initiative. Um, any commitments you see around circular, uh, around the circular economy today are just going to be overwhelmed by um, the, the current commitments around virgin plastic production. So as Peter mentioned, you know, the, the numbers are staggering and having any chance to look at creating a circular economy de facto requires some limits to be placed on virgin plastic production. Otherwise, we just won't really have a chance in the next 10 years to get to a circular economy. And then lastly, is this point around, um, you know, why we're all here. Um, this is an entrenched geopolitical problem. 45% of the polymers that are produced there are traded. So it is a, um, you know, covering multiple jurisdictions as we think about how we manage them. And state ownership, which is, I think, another interesting point, represents more than 30% of polymer production. So governments, de facto, through their ownership of plastic production facilities, actually have an important role to play. And that's where global treaty mechanisms like this can actually be um, particularly useful and helpful in making um, this transition happen more quickly. So that was a quick race through um, our work. And then, as I said, I will quickly drop into uh, the, uh, the chat here, our report, if people would like to get a little bit more information and the results of who's in the, who's in the top 10 and um, top 20, you can sort of peruse the, the information in more detail at your convenience. Thanks, Diana. Okay, thank you very much, Nakul. That's, that's good timekeeping as well. <laughs> um, very, very interesting presentation. And I'm particularly struck by your, your argument that by changing the uh, source of polymers and the type of polymers will have a major impact because that links very nicely with, um, with Peter Borke's presentation before where I saw in his chart the proportion of uh, growth from packaging is just immense in, in, his, um, in his picture there. So I see that a very nice link between the two presentations. Thank you very much. Um, moving now to uh, Carolyn, my colleague. Are you there, Carolyn? Super. Um, Carolyn probably needs no introduction, but just in case she needs a quick one, let me just say she is the director of the new uh, TESS Institute and the Global Governance Center from the Graduate Institute, a senior researcher. So um, Carolyn, over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Diana. It's really a, a great joy to be on this panel with such excellent speakers this afternoon. So information about how much is traded and among which countries is really critical to efforts um, of governments and stakeholders to tackle plastic pollution. 
Governments need to understand what plastics are flowing in and out of their country and at different points along the plastics life cycle in order to make informed policy choices about whether, where and how to intervene um, in ways that would support their plastic uh, pollution reduction goals and also to ensure that trade is aligned with sustainability goals. So to improve our capacity to monitor plastics trade, UNCTAD and the Graduate Institute have been developing a plastics trade database that identifies trade flows across the life cycle of plastics. Um, it draws um, on the UN's International Statistics Database, which is called UN ComTrade, which itself is based on official sources, so data that, that national governments provide. So a public version of our database is going to go online finally uh, in September, in just a few weeks, and we'll um, it will cover uh, the period from 2002 to 2021. So this afternoon, I'm just going to prevent, present a snapshot of some of the findings of the joint research that Diana and I have been doing um, on these trade flows across the life cycle of plastics. A key message is, is that it's not as easy as one might think to get the full picture of plastics trade flows. And I'll note some of the challenges we've encountered um, and some possible ways forward. So the key thing is that international trade flows are central to the global plastics economy. There are important trade flows across the life cycle from fossil fuel feedstocks um, to uh, additives, primary plastics, so the resins and fibers, um, in a whole range of plastic final uh, products. So ranging from plastic packaging to synthetic textiles. We also have trade in products that contain plastic. So they have embedded plastic, products that are packaged in plastic, there's also the use of plastic in the transportation across borders. Um, we have trade in plastic waste, in plastic conversion and manufacturing machinery, and also in waste management technologies. So as you can see on this slide, the trade in plastics is immense. It sums up to a value of at least one trillion um, US dollars in 2019, or more than 5% of the total value of global trade um, in plastics. And that figure doesn't include um, the trade in additives and feedstocks, which are noted there on the top left. A further important um, point on this slide is that our figure of a trillion uh, dollars by value is almost 40% higher than previous estimates. Now here it's important to understand quickly a little bit about how trade statistics are gathered. Um, so they're based on the World Customs Organization's um, Harmonized Commodity Description and Coding Systems, otherwise known as the HS. And in that classification system, there is a chapter number 39 that focuses specifically on plastics. And it's often used to, while it's often used to track plastics trade, it doesn't include all of the plastics that cross borders. So our joint database um, compiles trade flows that are in this chapter 39. It also includes plastic trade flows that are um, in the UN Com Trade system, but are outside chapter 39. This includes a really important um, range of products, including synthetic rubbers, um, including for tires, one of the issues that Peter uh, mentioned in his presentation, but also textile products and also products like fishing nets and nappies, some of which are made entirely of plastics. And we also include input flows. So what you can see here is we tried to classify these across sort of life cycle categories from primary forms through intermediate, manufactured and waste. Um, uh, so one of the things that um, we also do in the online database is provide it, we zero in on some particular areas like plastic packaging and synthetic textiles, because we think they might be of particular relevance to policymakers. And building on Nicole's work, I think it's now obvious to me that we should also have or develop a specific window through which to track trade in single use plastics and, and cluster them together so that they're easily identifiable for researchers and policymakers. Um, now, notably, the real vol volumes of trade are higher than what you see here. Um, because we don't, we weren't able to capture a vast volume of hidden plastic trade flows. And that's because they can't be tracked through official tra trade statistics. Um, so these hidden flows include all of that um, plastic that's embedded in other products like cars, household goods and electronics that aren't classified as plastics per se, but we all know they have a huge, um, uh, a great share of plastic within them. It also doesn't include um, pre-packaged uh, products that are pre-packaged in plastic like all of the plastic that's associated with food and beverages um, and pre, you know, processed food and so on does, is not reflected in these statistics, nor is the plastic used in transportation. Now, Paolo will talk uh, more about this in our session on trade policy tomorrow. But in short, our preliminary estimates that while we have some 350 million metric tons of plastic that crosses borders um, through this analysis that we have had, we're looking at at least another 70 million tons um, in addition to that, and most of that is in the kinds of plastics that are causing a particular pollution problem in the oceans, like packaging. Um, 
so a key point here is that while to date there's been a great focus on trade in plastic waste, which is vital because of its direct impact on leakage um, of plastics into the environment and especially the oceans, it's really important that we also look at trade flows up, upstream. And this is really important because we know that there are, um, there's huge economic stakes in plastic uh, trade in primary plastics and also because imported plastic products add to the stock of plastic that will eventually become part of the plastic waste stream that countries have to manage. So it's not just the fact that you're importing waste, it's the fact that you're importing products that at some point your country has to manage um, and deal with. So moving to slide two, um, notably for some parts of the plastics life cycle, trade represents a really significant um, share of production. So exports in primary forms of plastics in 2019 accounted for more than half, so 56% of the total value um, of, of primary plastics production in that year. Some 204 million metrics of tons of um, virgin plastics were shipped internationally. Um, an important point to note here is there's also a problem of loss of plastic pellets during international transportation. Um, so moving to slide three, just to give you another snapshot, this is about trade in empty plastic packaging. Now, as I noticed in the classifications, you could only track this empty plastic packaging. This is a fraction of the plastic packaging that actually crosses borders. Um, so here we had a total of 15.6 million um, metric tons, which is traded internationally, which is far, far, far more than the plastic waste that is traded internationally. And it's worth over 55 billion US dollars. And interestingly, overall, you'll see that China and Europe, um, if you take all of the individual EU countries together, were the highest overall exporters of plastic packaging by value, followed by the United States. Um, so moving to slide four, um, here you'll see that um, Overall, as I, on the first slide, I mentioned that plastic waste trade is small as a proportion of the overall value of plastics trade, but it still presents huge environmental challenges. Um, and the, the image here captures the fact that many countries are involved as exporters and importers of plastic waste. And um, we'll speak more tomorrow in detail on the challenges of regulating that waste trade. But an important point here is that the kind of data presented doesn't capture all plastic waste traded an important volume of plastic waste is traded under the wrong codes and is so is not captured here. And sometimes it's, it's, it's traded intentionally under the wrong codes and sometimes just because countries and exporters don't know how best to classify their trade. So it's actually pretty hard to get a, an accurate picture. And there's also a growing, um, uh, um, there's also a growing illegal plastic waste trade. Um, so just moving to my last slide, uh, I hope we're up to the right one. Are we up to the right one? Yes, perfect, excellent. Um, so while some countries dominate the import and export of plastics, all countries are involved in some ways in the global plastics economy as producers or consumers. An important value add of our trade database is it's gonna be easy to help you visually trace how different countries participate in trade across the plastic life cycle and to look at the bilateral flows at different, um, at different points in the life cycle. And here it's just to illustrate um, the top 10 exporters across key categories. And you'll see there are many countries involved, but there are some key countries like China, Germany, and the US that are prominent across um, the life cycle um, as exporters. So finally, um, while there's a number of important efforts that we've heard about to tackle plastic pollution, there's really been a vast gap in analysis and cooperation on the trade related aspects of promoting a more sustainable plastics economy. Um, we'll talk more about that tomorrow about what can be done on the international trade policy side. But meanwhile, just some quick last thoughts on the trade data. Um, the first is that we're uh, finalizing a study on where and how governments could make improvements in the HS classifications that would help um, governments and stakeholders better understand trade flows in plastics and to develop appropriate policy responses. This is something that we would need some member states to take up and really work on how we can get better statistics about this. And related to this is a need to continue work to devise ways of monitoring these hidden flows um, of plastic, especially those that are most critical from a pollution perspective, um, like plastic packaging. Um, and finally, it will be really great to have more focused national and regional research understanding the plastic trade flows in and out of countries and their relevance to the plastic pollution challenges that countries face at the national level. So thank you, Dana. I hope I somehow kept within time. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, great presentation. Um, I think that it's very important, the, the message that, that you've highlighted here, which is how trade is absolutely central 
to the plastic life cycle story. And um, it's also very interesting that, you know, all our previous speakers are now talking about plastic life cycle, not plastic waste only. And I think this is really important um, contribution that's come out of, of the, the trade database. Uh, if I could say so myself, being part of it, but you know, from, from all of the work that you know, the waste story has been very, very important, but now we also realize that waste is, is the tip of the iceberg and we have to look at the whole thing. Um, and I think that that message is becoming um, very coherent now. So I would like to thank you very much, Caroline. We will move to Andres de Castillo. Are you here, Andres? Thank you. So Andres is the senior legal advisor with CL, which is um, an institution that I'm sure you all know very well, because not only do they do wonderful research on the plastics issue, but it's also very beautiful, which um, we don't always see in our work. So thank you for the contribution that you're making to our debate. Um, Andre, I give you the floor. Thank you, Diana, for the introduction. And uh, it's getting very hard now for me to raise the the bar after the, the presentation from Nakul, Peter and Caroline, but I will try to do my best also to not repeat what was said in the panel and in the session before. And I will share my screen to, to if I can. Uh, of course, it's not possible. Let's see. Otherwise, if you can share the, the presentation, that will be great. Um, and can you share the presentation and then yes. Andres, you just tell us when to change the page. Exactly. Andres, we'll have it up uh, with you just to give us a few minutes. We'll be there. You can go ahead Thank and you. do that. Yes, but at the beginning will be only my name at the title of the presentation. But I want to, to share and to frame this conversation, as Diana said, not only with a list of important meetings that are happening uh, this month and the months to come, but also to highlight the meeting happening in two days is, if I remember well, the first uh, high-level ministerial meeting that framed the conversation on plastic pollution and not only a matter of plastic of marine litter. And this is really important because uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, the discussion goes beyond the issue of marine litter and plastic waste. And even the panelists uh, um, made a really interesting effort to show that part, that there is a life cycle of plastics uh, and there are a negative impact in the full life cycle of those plastics uh, on every stage. We are going to try to um, to highlight two specific components. That is the uh, we can move to the other um, slide, please. To this idea of um, climate and biodiversity, and from climate as as uh, you already know, by 2050, the greenhouse gas emissions from plastic could reach over 56 gigatons. This represents, to be conservative, uh, 10 to 13% of the entire remaining carbon budget. Um, on biodiversity, that uh, uh, is also important to say, and this is a global biodiversity outlook that quote a report from Pew, I saw, um, uh, one of the questions related to uh, her, the conversation with the uh, OECD outlook and then the Pew research from last year saying the estimates here saying like, if we do what we promise, we only can't uh, um, can change really few or little what we need. And that the projection for entering on the aquatic ecosystem of uh, plastic pollution will uh, double, triple the levels from 2016 by 2040. Under a business as usual scenario is doing what we are trying to do, as we can see in the, in the right um, part of your screen with the graphic that shows who uh, and where is produced, is, is produced the plastics. And uh, look at this. Uh, uh, now we're getting expert to read the kind of chart with the pandemic and uh, and see, we will see a huge wave. I will say that tsunami of plastic is coming. And we, we are already seeing the effect of that. Next slide, please. And um, previously I want to highlight why I 
make this connection with uh, the two or the three uh, interplanetary crises that is climate change, biodiversity loss and, and degradation and pollution because the plastic issue is not only a question of, of marine litter or only a question of plastic pollution. It goes beyond that part. And the link can be made with what is happening on climate change and what is happening with biodiversity loss. Both are common concern of humankind. So perhaps in this conference, the ministerial conference, we can finally declare and say that plastic is a common concern of humankind and try to find legally and economically and socially the best uh, potential path to solve this uh, specific crisis. And uh, here we can see also in the projection that are not really uh, optimistic about uh, what uh, if plastic production and use grows as currently planned, also as a business as usual. By 2030, this emission could reach 1.32 gigatons per year, which is an equivalent of to have around 300 new 500 megawatts coal fire power plants. And by 2050, we are talking about 650 coal plants that will be the equivalent of the uh, production and use of uh, of plastic right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on biodiversity, uh, we will see after, but now the question is uh, uh, about the governance and the current governance. And we see that on the frame of chemical and waste and the frame of biodiversity and species and on pollution, there is some, I've read some legislation and some legal tools for when we talk about land, ocean, or ocean beyond national jurisdiction uh, possibilities to, to solve the problem. And we have already in the UNCLOS, that is the constitution of the sea, a general uh, legal obligation of reduction of uh, marine litter that might include plastic there too. So already there are some sets, some ground already uh, to uh, expand the discussion and uh, try to see the best option. As we uh, in CL we're trying to do is we're trying to frame to say, hey, we need to act now, but also act globally and holistically, meaning that, uh, and here I will disagree with the uh, statement from the Mindoro Foundation saying that the, the strategy for climate that is this vestment, we're talking about, about the same problem with a different name uh, that is plastic production. And as we see how, uh, uh, the fossil fuel is driving this crisis too. I guess there are some strategies and some discussion that need to be uh, need, need to be interrelated too. Uh, next slide, please. And to, uh, to talk a little bit about biodiversity, we can say that according to the Second World Ocean Assessment, that the presence of plastic has been record in more than one. Uh, 1,400 marine species, only marine species were, were seen. The IBIS report said a more conservative uh, number that was 256, and this is the new one. Uh, so when we are estimating that and where we are saying what is happening, what is the global dimension of this problem, we can also use uh, what is happening with animals and uh, biodiversity. Uh, and how that is affecting them and also affecting our life and uh, the health, the, the human health. And uh, one of the conclusions is without Im improved international policies and mobilization, plastic pollution will only worse. This is what say the second world ocean assessment, that is one of the main uh, assessments related to the ocean. And is global, it's not only on plastic, but this is what they say on plastic. Next slide, please. Here you will find and, um, some of the resources that uh, we uh, at CL together with other partners produce uh, related to uh, future free or conventional plastic related to the link between plastic and health and the link between plastic and, and climate and also uh, uh, what are the next steps. I, I hope I cover some of the of the main important aspects here, but I, I am available for, for remaining questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. That was really interesting. Um, um, I'm very struck by the link that you are making strongly with uh, plastics and the climate debate as well. So it's, it's 
um, pollution and now beyond pollution. And um, particularly the, the picture you have of the, you know, how it's, um, if plastic doesn't, isn't reduced, we are looking at having um, the equivalent of all these new coal stations, which is kind of ironic when with the climate mandates of many banks and governments, they're not investing in coal anymore. So, you know, it would be very ironic if we had the same impact because of plastic. So thank you very much. Um, so moving to our last speaker, um, Marcos Orellana, the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. Um, Marcos, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And also thanks to the Graduate Institute uh, for this uh, opportunity to engage in this conversation. What doubt can there be at this stage that plastics is a global problem? Previous speakers have clearly laid this out. Uh, volumes of production, volumes of waste. Uh, we could also speak, speak about additives uh, and how these uh, are capable of long range transport and accumulation. The, uh, the point that few companies have an outsized responsibility for the, for the crisis that a few countries dominate international trade while all countries uh, participate in it. Uh, my contention today is that not enough attention has been given to the global human rights impact of the pl plastics uh, crisis. Uh, as, uh, as you yourself, Diana, and also Andres mentioned, waste uh, seen as, a, as the tip of the iceberg, but we're seeing these, uh, these impacts along the whole cycle of plastics. Uh, each stage of the plastics cycle, and I'm not speaking about life cycle because there's nothing alive in it, uh, thinking about extraction, manufacturing, transport, use, disposal, all of these, each of these have human rights implications that are serious, widespread and global and that affect specifically and particularly those groups in vulnerable situations, such as children exposed in the use of uh, plastics that contain toxic additives, such as workers that work in petrochemical companies or waste pickers down at the uh, waste end of things, or indigenous peoples that suffer the impact of extraction of fossil fuels from which the overwhelming majority of polymers are, are made. Um, this is not even mentioning future generations. What world are we leaving uh, for the future? And as much as insufficient attention has been given to the human rights impacts, there's also been insufficient attention provided to the key role of human rights principles in the design of a legitimate and an effective policy response. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I will argue that a rights-based approach is critical to a legitimate and an effective uh, solution to the problem. Legitimate in that solutions should not come at the expense of the rights of people that are already in situations of vulnerability and effectiveness so that solutions may actually resolve uh, the problem. There is a solid foundation to a rights-based approach in international law already. Uh, the obligations established in human rights law on states and corporate responsibilities to address risk and to cooperate in transboundary environmental issues, trans uh, global environmental issues, these are duties that are well established. The obligations on access to information, participation and remedy, these procedural duties are also well established and can inform what is an effective and legitimate policy response. But beyond the obligations, perhaps uh, thinking about the experience of the climate change and human rights debates that have played out over the last decade, perhaps 15 years or so, can also be instructive. Because maybe 10 years ago, when I was doing this work and speaking about the importance of human rights and, and climate change, I was met with arguments such as, well, these are human rights are only going to complicate what are already difficult negotiations. We should keep, keep them focused. We should keep them narrow so that we can actually have solutions. Or 
arguments such as uh, human rights will politicize issues that are in their nature eminently technical and there's no need to bring in a, a complicating or confounding factor. But if we look at, for example, what has been the experience of, of the Paris Agreement, which as, as, as you may know, in its preamble recognizes, it reaffirms, it recalls the uh, obligations, the human rights obligations of, of states in, 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 its, in the response measures. These, this language has been incredibly important for implementation. There are a number of countries that are taking these obligations to heart in their design of national action plans to deal with climate change and where countries are lagging or dragging their feet or failing to uphold human rights obligations civil society is taking them to court successfully in a number of instances. And so the uh, right to healthy environment, uh, uh, the other human rights implicated by climate change impacts or by procedural obligations in, re in relation to climate change policy, there are important lessons than a, that a legally binding instrument on plastics can learn from this. Uh, among those lessons, principles of human rights for a chemically safe circular economy stand out. Uh, remedies are, of course, critical to a rights-based approach. Thinking about, for example, the recent incident of the express pearl of the coasts of Sri Lanka. Uh, so the contamination of nurdles. What about the impacts on coastal communities? What kind of remedies do they have? Uh, are existing instruments sufficient? Could a legally binding instrument on plastics address that. There are also issues of information and participation that are critical. Uh, perhaps the example of recycling here is instructive. As a result of disinformation campaigns, largely by industry, there is a sense in the general population that recycling offers a viable solution to plastics. But we know this is not the case because of the scientific evidence because of the volumes of production, because of the toxic additives in plastics. So current state of technology capacity uh, is not able to deal with, uh, with recycling in an effective manner, not to mention that even less than 10% of uh, plastics are recycled or have been recycled or will be recycled. Uh, so there's, there's the question of access to information. The right to science is something that I also wish to uh, emphasize because it does require governments to align their policies with the best available scientific evidence. And la lastly, questions of prevention and the polluter pays principle. Here, the, the tool of extended producer responsibilities has been elaborated and is, uh, by a number of countries and it's expanding. But I will pose the question about extended producer responsibilities beyond boundaries uh, is uh, in the general frame of these uh, initiatives, the importer acquires responsibility, but what about the producer of plastics that then get exported? In the uh, global economy and the north-south dynamics, uh, often international trade and unfortunately sham recycling are a recipe for the transfer of hazardous substances or wastes to uh, the countries in the developing world that have the least capacity to deal with them. I'm running out of time. I do want to mention the importance of assessment and false or misleading solutions as well, point to the perils of incineration and the uh, number of uh, problems that can be associated by that. Uh, but simply to conclude, I will present, be presenting on these issues to the United Nations General Assembly uh, next uh, October and making a plea for a rights-based uh, approach to the design of any legally binding instrument on plastics that may be negotiated to address the global plastics crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that was really very, very interesting indeed. And um, you, you're bringing in a different element that we haven't heard uh, much about yet in this um, conference anyway. Um, and um, I, I think it's very, um, very important, this message that you're saying that there's the link with the climate justice and the human rights 
element and um, this this um, absolutely uh, critical element that needs to be brought into the treaty. And um, I think we can we can start the um, the questions and the comments now. So, um, Marcos, we'll, we'll come back to you <laughs> with, with a question. But if I can start at the beginning with our first speaker, um, Peter, uh, you were slightly cut off in your presentation. I think you had to race through. So perhaps you would like to take one or two minutes just to, to tell us some messaging that you didn't get the chance to, uh, to deliver. And then we can go on and we will ask each, each speaker to, um, to make a final point. We do have questions, but they're all quite technical and better dealt with bilaterally, I think. So I would prefer it if the speakers could take this moment to share one, maybe one important point that you feel you didn't get the chance to make. Um, and if you, if you did make all your points, then please tell us something like, what is the most important step as to where we go next? Thank you. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Diana. And, uh, uh... I think I'd like to use my minutes, um, two minutes, <laughs> to to raise two points. First of all, uh, about the sort of policy interventions uh, that we we need uh, to fix this problem, um, and I think this is also in relation to the first panel uh, where a lot of emphasis was placed on prevention measures going, you know, and I think also Nakul made, made this, uh, this comment uh, earlier on, um, you know, addressing the issue at source. Actually, what, what we are finding with some of the projections that we're sort of mulling through now uh, is that in fact, you need all interventions really. You cannot exclude any, and you, you also need cleanup, in fact. Uh, the simple reason for this is that, um, uh, plastics emissions, even if we manage, managed to reduce our plastic emissions to zero, um, the, the, the ecosystems where plastics have accumulated uh, over the past 50 years will still be uh, releasing plastics into the oceans, for instance, for decades and decades to come. So, so in fact, to achieve zero additional plastics as in the G20 uh, Osaka Blue Ocean Vision, you need to uh, add some, some clean, up, clean up measures as well. So that, that's one thing. The other thing I wanted uh, to, to briefly speak to is COVID and the impact of the pandemic um, on uh, our yeah, global plastics usage. Um, I think, uh, Andres, you made this uh, uh, comment suggesting that uh, you know, the pandemic has actually had a horrific effect on, on the use of um, and accelerated the use of plastics which certainly is true uh, in very small segments of the plastics market, such as, of course, for personal protective equipment, uh, where indeed, uh, you know, the use of plastics has increased very significantly, but it's a very small market um, overall, given, you know, the overall uh, plastic uh, market. And in fact, the uh, fact that we've essentially stopped the economy for a few months back in 2020, has in fact reduced global plastics production by a few percentage points. And we were reporting on that in our global plastics output as well. So just, you know, two, two, two additions maybe, hope, hopefully helpful. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, let me move now to Nakul, if you could, um, are you there? Yes. Uh, if you could um, tell us, you know, what would be your one thing, maybe, if you wanted to, to, to move on this, the most important, what is the most important priority? So I'm reading back through my notes to see what did I write during your presentation. Um, no problem. I, 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 what I, I would just reiterate, I think, what Peter said, that I think, um, you know, we should be careful of not looking for silver bullets in how we think about dealing with um, the plastics challenge. Um, as Peter said, you know, the the point here is I think they're all different tools will be needed depending on where in the value chain you're looking at in which jurisdiction, because different just jurisdictions have different um, intervention models that are going to be more amenable than others. Um, and you know, if you only have to look at Europe where we've had an EPR for many, many years, but it's really only when we got an EPR and a recycled content standard that you actually started to see things starting to shift in terms of the recycling rates of one type of polymer, right? And now apply this to 
you know, 50 types of polymers out there. It, it's, we've got a long road ahead of us. And I think just a quick rebuttal to Andreas's point, a message, message in there, but I don't think it's necessary that we're in disagreement around um, divestment strategies. I just think that divestment strategies have very quickly become a hammer looking for a nail. And there are actually ways for shareholder activism to play a much more productive internal role that doesn't have to be limited to just divestment, but rather that changing policies and from, in, from inside. I mean, a lot still to be seen in terms of what engine one is going to accomplish with with Exxon, but I think it's an interesting and promising approach to say, you know, to actually taking on a handful of board seats, advocating from the inside may actually get us at a minimum transparency in terms of the internal decision-making processes and maybe actually a shift in capital allocations from a company like Exxon. But I actually think Exxon's at very much at one end of um, the spectrum and there are many more in the middle who I think we could help encourage to make a transition. So I think just sort of looking at it more holistically in that sense. To pick up on that, um, Nakul, you mentioned in your presentation that 30% of polymer production is state-owned. Um, and Correct. you're talking about the kind of the geopolitical use of the polymers. Are you seeing evidence where state owners are actively trying to nudge firms or to nudge processes in, the, in that kind of direction? Um, sort of, I'd say anecdotally, um, what you are seeing, I think, in Europe, for example, where um, I think the social contract is a little bit more robust and, and there's just, you know, you're seeing EU, European Commission policy driving in a direction. You're starting to see where state-owned ownership, um, whether it's majority or minority, is playing a role in influencing companies. Um, but by no means is this sort of, a, uh, do we see this as sort of being spelled out in um, you know, national level policies in any place that's saying, you know, we're going to drive a national agenda around this. Um, but Andreas may have actually seen this in more detail, but at least we haven't from, from what, when we were looking. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Carolyn, over to you. Uh, Great. Thank you. Want... Thank you so much, Diana. Um, just, to, just to jump in on your point about state ownership and um, Nekul, just to, to make a plug for one of, or two of our um, coming panels, and the next panel, I know Ron Steenblick is going to look, um, provide an update on some of his work to try and look at subsidies to the petrochemicals and plastics um, sector. And in there, I know that he highlights the fact that it's particularly difficult to track um, subsidies for state-owned enterprises um, and to understand really what's going on. And of course, this is often linked to great sort of oil and gas um, strategic investments of company of, of countries. So it's it's a great sort of a, a bigger geopolitical question. And also on the same note, I'll plug our panel on petrochemicals, where there's also some work looking at um, uh, lending from multilateral development banks and export credit agencies to the expansion of um, petrochemical um, production, which is another um, sort of element of the subsidies discussion. But just specifically on my points around trade flows, um, I just I, there was a question that went to me about whether or not we um, a plan to propose an upgrade to the WCO framework for the classifications of plastics. And as I mentioned just briefly at the end of my presentation, we are currently doing a study on this. Um, we've consulted with quite a range um, of people to get input from them on it. And I'd be more than happy if people listening today want to provide some input into that. But the idea is to... Um, propose uh, a set of recommend, provide a set of recommendations to the world uh, customs organizations with the aim that one or more states, hopefully more states will propose a set of amendments to the trade classifications. Um, and we think this is really, really important to help us get a handle on hidden flows in plastics. So all of the plastics that are embedded in um, products that are not labeled as plastic products in the trade classification system, and also to try and get a handle on all of this plastic that's um, packaging that's traded that's associated with goods. And the WCO explicitly says that aside from the rules of interpretation, except for empty plastic packaging, all other plastic packaging is associated with the good that is traded that it's traded with. So it's really, really difficult to get a handle on the volume and value of that. We can trace trade flows in empty plastic bottles, but we can't trade track trade flows in, um, you know, the, the, the bottles with already the liquid in it, if you, if you see what I mean. And there are other ways we can do this. We don't have to just rely on the HS system. So in some of the work that Nakul has been doing, companies have their own figures on what they're doing. So there's other ways of, of, of 
of doing that, but we think it would be useful to have more official information about this and to see if we can't upgrade the system so it's a little more useful to countries trying to regulate in this space. So it really, it's, it's a very technical and techie kind of issue, but it would be great to have input from people on, you know, we really need to make sure we're focused on the kind of data that matters um, and getting information that will actually be helpful to stakeholders, to businesses and to policymakers in that space. And just the very last point was on hidden plastic. I just an appeal to stay tuned for Paula's presentation tomorrow because she has been developing um, our first sort of preliminary effort at a methodology for measuring some of this hidden plastic, embedded plastic and pla um, plastic packaging to try and give us some scale of the trade um, in, in that. So that's all from me, but thank you so much, Diana. And great panel, thank you. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Carolyn. So let's um, turn to, to Andres de Castillo. Uh, if you had one priority that you had to, to pick up on, you, you've mentioned there's a tsunami of plastic coming um, with the COVID. Um, you've also mentioned the role with the climate and uh, biodiversity goals, as well as uh, plastic pollution. Um, so please, maybe you could expand on that, or if there's some other comment that you feel you haven't made that you'd like to make, please let us know. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I apologize in advance because I made a confusion with the question of COVID. I said COVID has, has put some wish, has made more clear that there is something there, you know, with pro uh, personal protection equipment. But the tsunami I'm talking about is with the plastic even before the COVID situation. What we are seeing are, is projections of the plastic industry. Um, so this is first to, to say that part. Secondly, um, there is something that I, I want to answer that is uh, from uh, in the Q&A question from Robson, and he's asking uh, about the common goals, if there is a global agreement and uh, we together with other scientists and professors and, and, and different stakeholders produce a, um, an article for the science. And there you can see the three main goals where we include um, minimize virgin plastic production and consumption. And we say minimize, not reduce. Minimize is an additional effort to, reduce, to, to put to the minimal level, not reduction. And uh, the second is facilitate safe circularity. And I highlight the question of safe, to include non-toxic circularity. And the third one is eliminate uh, plastic pollution where there are uh, different strategies where, that we put that there to prioritize. And finally, uh, there's something on climate change that I don't want to mention because that could be more anecdotal to, to, to try to put the dots together. And is that already the UN said that at the global scale, uh, methane emissions are responsible for around 30% of warming since the pre-industrial era. And there's an important emissions of methane from oil and gas production, which produce the majority of plastics. This is simple as that, but it's not. <laughs> as I will say, this where we are trying is highlight some data, but it's not as simple as uh, just given the data. And on plastic, there is already studies that shows that uh, uh, the most commonly used plastic produce two greenhouse gases, methane and ethylene, in, in scientific studies when exposed to ambient solar radiation. So there's some links already to do with what um, science is telling, to, uh, is telling us and the precautionary principle need to be used here. Also with the common by differentiated responsibilities too need to be highlighted. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andres. So turning to our last speaker, Marcos Orellano, um, please, uh, your moment to... <laughs> to tell the floor what is the most important priority or your, your most um, compelling direction for us at this moment. Th thank you, Diana. If, if I could address a couple of the questions that have been posed on the, on the Q&A, Andres was already talking about the objective. I want to recall that the Paris Agreement not only contains a numerical ob objective on, on mitigation, but uh, its Article 2 also speaks about adaptation and uh, financial flows as objectives of the agreement. And so in that line, uh, thinking about objectives for a legally binding instrument on plastics, one could think of, in addition to what has already been said, one could think about uh, further elaboration of what are essential uses. Uh, the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances can be used here as a, as a model. 
similarly, what additives can be used? This can uh, then help with, uh, with recycling. Uh, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants may be a model here, here although there's much, much more that needs to be done. And certainly human rights is an element of, of the objective uh, for the reasons I laid out uh, previously. And that takes me to the other question I see there. What should governments do in the face of the public perception regarding waste collection? It, the, uh, the special rapporteur on the right to freedom of opinion and expression has elaborated on disinformation and disinformation campaigns and highlighted that governments have the responsibility to correct the record. So there is an active role of governments to step in the public debate and distribute accurate information about the current the existing dangers and pitfalls or limitations of recycling. The other thing that I would mention on this issue is the need for governmental support to waste pickers. Uh, to, just like a just transition, leaving no one behind in the transformation of energy matrix, the transformation of um, of the plastics economy will require government intervention so that those people who currently depend or derive a, a livelihood uh, out, of, uh, out of waste uh, are not adversely affected. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Diana. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Andres. I'm, I'm glad you, you redirected us back to the questions and answers, which I think we've actually um, dealt with all of those now. But there is one question remaining about um, uh, a support team in the Asia-Pacific region and uh, with ambitions for zero plastic production in India by 2030 and removal of plastic waste. Um, is there anyone in the panel that would like to, uh, to address that question either uh, now or if not, please do it. Um, maybe you could do it bilaterally in the, in the, um, in the Q&A. Is this, is this something that you feel um, that someone can address right at this moment? Doesn't look I'll like just it. Say that, um, I'll just sort of throw out quickly that WWF India is working on building a coalition. Um, and so they might be a good first port of call. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Vishnu. I hope that helps answer your question. Um, I think that we will have some um, other speakers over the next few days who will be addressing um, particular either programs or projects that include the Asia Pacific region. So I hope that you'll be able to stay for those. All right, look, well, in that case, we are going to finish um, really on time. In fact, we're one minute early. So um, I will just take that minute to say thank you to everybody for these really excellent, excellent presentations. And I think this is a fabulous start to a very important meeting. So I'm going to, um, to let us all leave now. You have 15 minutes before the next session starts. So. Um, we look forward to seeing you back here again shortly. Thank you all very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Bye-bye.